Thank you, Pastor. It's great to be here at Calvary Baptist in Willard. We have a lot of memories from this church, and you have stood with us for over 40 years. And some of you made clothes for, I think, Yvonne made clothes for Debbie and then brought them over um, to you. There was a group of you women that even went over to Greenville, Ohio, and presented them to us. And uh, you have been faithfully giving and you have helped in special projects. And so thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. And one of the things that Debbie and I really like, and we come back to our supporting churches and we recognize people. Thank you for your faithfulness in attending. And so take your Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 2. And while you Acts chapter 1. Sorry, we will get to Acts chapter 2, but we're going to start in 1 first. But we have a little display table out in the, I don't know if it's the foyer, but um, before you get to the food, just take a right. And so um, veil yourself if you don't have one of our prayer cards. Um, get one of our prayer cards. All of our information is on the back, our address and phone number if you're on your way if you're going to do vacation and in, in um, Myrtle Beach or somewhere along that we're halfway between here and Myrtle Beach so don't get a hotel just come and stay with us and so um, get a prayer card but also pick up one of these Matthew 9 38 pray ye therefore the Lord the harvest that he would send forth labors it's the Lord who sends forth and we're commanded to pray and so this is a 30-day prayer guide that just sort of orients you and guides you how to pray for missions. And so avail yourself to that. Um, and Acts chapter 1. And so pastors already read the text. Um, but one of the verses that most people learn even through Awana and in missions is Acts 1.8. But the context is this is verse comes 40 days after Christ's resurrection. And in verse 3 it talks about he's been showing himself for 40 days. And in verse 4 the disciples are told to go back to Jerusalem and wait. Now, how many of you like to wait? <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if it's just me, but it, it didn't make any difference. I'll switch lines or something, and then the person in front. And so um, we got used to waiting in Chad because it would take up to two and a half hours to cash a check on a good day. And so you just waited. And um, so, but the disciples are told to wait and that the Holy Spirit would come, according to verse 5, not many days hence. And so they are to wait. Now, why were they to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit? That's explained in verse 8. So, they're told to wait. Why? But ye shall receive power when? After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. It doesn't say, you know, it's um, when our boys were younger, um, you know, there would uh, you would say, well, um, will you do this? Uh, and I said, no, you will do this. And this is, this is sort of the emphasis. The Holy Spirit's going to come on, and you will be, thou shalt be, you will be witnesses. Jerusalem, which is around your home, Judea, Samaria, and the innermost parts of the earth. But their witnessing is tied to the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to be in court to be a witness, 
But a witness only shares what they know. They, you know, if you go, well, I think, no, 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 what did you see? What do you know? That's what a witness does. And so they were going to be witnesses, but their, the fact of their being a witness was tied to the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you've gone through, and you can do this later and check yourself all through the book of Acts, but it's, it's fascinating that the disciples witnessing is always tied to the Holy Spirit. I'll give you an example. Look at Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so now we're 10 days later, because Christ ascended after 40 days, and Pentecost was 50 days after the resurrection, and after his death, was fully come, and they were all in one cord, in one place, all the disciples are there, and the Holy Spirit comes, and look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to what? To speak. And if you trace through, and we're going to look at some of them, but if you trace through the book of Acts, every time the Holy Spirit comes, people speak. Because Acts 1.8 says you, the Holy Spirit's going to come and you will be witnesses and so the Holy Spirit comes and they began to speak in tongues other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance and look look at all of this look in in verse 6 the end of verse 6 now when this was noise abroad them all came together and were confounded because that every man heard them what speak in his own language and look at verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which, what? Speak Galileans. And you go down to verse 11, and it's this long list of all these countries and their languages. And it says, Cretes and Arabians do hear them, what? Speak in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. And so God, the Holy Spirit, as he came upon them and filled them, gave the ability to speak in all these different languages. And faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, but they, the Holy Spirit came upon and people spoke because 1.8 says the Spirit's going to come and you shall be witnesses. And so almost every time that you go through the book of Acts, look at chapter 4. Turn over. I'll give you some exercise and then you won't go to sleep. But in Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost What's the next word? Said. Said unto them. So, again, the Holy Spirit comes and they speak. Look at verse 20. For we cannot but what? Speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they're giving a witness because of the promise given in Matthew in chapter 1. And verse 8, that the Holy Spirit's going to come and they will be witnesses. Look at chapter 4 and verse 31. <clears throat> and when they had prayed, the place was shaken and there were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they what? Spake the word of God with, with boldness. Again, the coming of the Holy Spirit and what do they do? They speak. And you can look at 532. And it says, we shall be, here's Peter, and he says, we, and we are his witnesses of these things, 
and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom we have given them to obey, and when they what? Verse 32, 33, heard this, which means what? Peter was speaking. And so you have the same thing in, I'm just going to, in 1039, 2616, verse 22. All these, this relationship between the coming of the Holy Spirit and speaking, being that witness. You can't get past that in the book of Acts. Now, I'm going to, as I tell my students in chat, on va faire une parenthèse. We're going to take a parenthesis. Because we have already seen between chapter 2 and chapter 5, how many times has Peter been filled with the Holy Spirit? At least three times. So there's a massive amount of confusion. So keep your hand here and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because don't get confused about two things. So did the Holy Spirit leave? Did he not leave? What is, what is the filling? We have to distinguish in theology you know, what's happened. The day of your salvation, if you are here this morning and you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all what? Baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and we've been all made to drink into one spirit. The day that you trusted Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ, which is the church. And so it happened the moment of salvation. The day you were saved, you got all of the Holy Spirit. You didn't get part of him. You got all of it. We were all baptized into the body of Christ, the church. But you have in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 18, it says, don't be filled with wine, but we won't be what? Filled with the Spirit. When I got saved, I got all of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit didn't get all of me. <laughs> And so you have the sanctifying process progressively where you turn over. There's a fascinating book, a little tiny little book about um, the rooms. And it takes a story of like a house. And it's about that this Christian and he, Christ was going to come and visit him. But there were certain rooms that he didn't want Christ to come into. And... So we got all of the Holy Spirit when we were saved, but he didn't get all of us. And we're never commanded in Scripture to be baptized by the Spirit because that happens at salvation. But we are commanded to be filled. When you give totally everything in your life over to the ministry and control of the Holy Spirit, then you're filled with the Spirit. And so... You're only baptized once, but you can be filled at multiple times. And so you can get up on Sunday morning and you just, you got the Christian radio on and you just, you've already prayed and you are, you're really, and you've already prayed that God would co totally control your life. And then you come to church and the pastor preaches on something and he he really zeroes on on you. And you're thinking in your mind, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. So you might have been filled when you left your house. But the minute you have said what? No, Lord, you can't have that part of You're no longer filled. And so that's why in the book of Acts, you'll see that they're filled multiple times. But I'm going to close the parentheses because we've already seen every time that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, what's the first thing they did? They, they witnessed. They spoke. 
And it goes back to this chapter and goes back to chapter 1. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses. Now, so our witness is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Every time the Spirit comes in the book of Acts, then they were witnesses of it. They spoke. So what kind, what are the characteristics of a Spirit-empowered witness? Go to chapter 4 of Acts. And we're going to see three characteristics of spirit-empowered witness. Now we're so we all, if you're here and you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit. And we are commanded to be his witnesses. Some of us we do it right around our house. Um Last night we went to, I don't know the name, we went to a Mexican restaurant and our, our waiter came and I said, we're going to pray and um, can we do something we pray for? And I thought he was going to start weeping. And he says, oh my word, he says, if you just pray for my mother and my brother, there's just a lot. Going. And I thought, you know, and so even that, you know, it's not like, you know, we gave the Romans road or we, you know, but you can be a witness. And I think he was really touched by the fact that we were going to pray for him. And they were concerned about the situation in his family. And God allows us to have these different opportunities to be a witness. But what were the characteristics of spirit-empowered witness in chapter 4? Go to verse 31. Acts 4, 31. Three characteristics of spirit-empowered witness. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake, notice the coming of the Spirit, and speaking, they spake the word of God with what? Boldness. One of the characteristics of spirit-empowered witness witnessing or being a witness is boldness now this is a sort of an interesting greek word it means outspoken it means assurance it means openness and what's fascinating me go back to verse 29 so that the the believers have just been praying and look at their request in verse 29 and now, O Lord, behold their threatening, and grant unto thy service that servants that we may all what? With all what? Boldness. They may speak thy word. So they have prayed that God would give them boldness, and then the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they are filled with the Spirit. And what do they do in their witness? They do it with boldness. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen boldness. Go back to chapter 3, or chapter 4, go back to verse 13. Just go back a couple verses from 31. And when they saw the what? Boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with who? <laughs> they had been with Jesus. So, but the Holy Spirit came upon Peter in verse 8. And so he's a witness in boldness. And this phrase is used multiple times in the book of Acts. Let me just show you one. Keep your hand here in chapter 4. We're going to come back. But go all the way to the end of Acts. All the way to chapter 26. 28, I think, yeah, 28. And the last verse in the book of Acts. So, verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years with his own hired house, in his own hired house, 
and received all that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all what? Confidence. That's exactly the same word, boldness, that's used in other places. And so, no man forbidding him. And so from the beginning of Acts all the way to the end of Acts, you see that when we're going to be witnesses to the Lord, an empowered witness, the first characteristic is boldness. Now, go back to chapter 4. And let's go to verse 33 to see the second characteristics. We're going to do another parenthesis, okay? How many years of history does the book of Acts cover? From beginning to the end, how many years? It's only 30 years. It's only 30 years of church history. <laughs> so you think of you think of all the whole known world was reached with the gospel in 30 years. How many, you know, and the massive number of churches that were planted in the three missionary journeys of, of Paul. And all that was within 30 years. I'll close the parentheses with that. But I mean, that just amazes me all that God did because they were what? They, they, were, they were empowered witnesses. And the boldness. But look at the th second characteristic of their empowered witness and look at verse 33. And with what? Great power. This is chapter 4 and verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So the second characteristic of empowered witness was the power of God. Now, generally, when this is the word for dynamite, explosive power. But most of the time when we think about that, what do we think about? We think about miracles. And you do have in chapter 3, you do have the lame man healed, but their witnessing was tied to what? They were going to be witnessing of the resurrection of Christ for people to get saved. So think with me of the power of God that all these lives that were transformed with the power of God. Think of Philip in Acts 8 going to Samaria. And it says the whole town, almost everyone in the whole town trusted Christ. I don't know if you've ever witnessed and a whole town has come to know the Lord. <laughs> I haven't. My, my father came into a village, I remember as a little boy, and um, preached. And just about everybody in that village came to trust Christ. And I asked him afterwards, and I was asking some of the older missionaries, and there was a, there's a story in Chad. And in Chad, this story, how many generations it's passed down, but all of this story is all across our part of Africa, and they believe at one time everybody was white. There were no black people or red people or anything, and everybody was white. And there was a great God spirit that ruled over the whole world. And things weren't perfect in an Adam and Eve state in the garden before they fell, but things were really good. And one day, someone stole a chicken. Now you're saying, a chicken. Well, a chicken in Chad represents a week's wages. So a chicken is really a big thing, even though they're banty chickens. And culturally, women are not allowed to eat chicken. Only men are allowed to eat chicken. Well, if you, your wives eat them and your the girls, there won't be enough for us men. I mean, chicken only has so much. But anyway, that's another whole side. But anyway, and the great, according to this story, the great God's spirit was so incensed that he turned them black. 
And this story is all over Africa that they think they're black because of God's punishment. And the great God Spirit says, you've ruined my world, so I can't stay with you anymore. But someday I will send somebody who will tell you how you can be back in fellowship with me again. And the great God Spirit left. This story was told from generation to generation until the gospel penetrated our part of Africa in the early 1900s. And they shared this message about that God created the world and he walked there in the, with them and there was fellowship. And then man sinned and God had to leave and he cast him out of the garden. And he couldn't walk with him anymore. But he sent his only son to die so that man could be back in fellowship with him. And it clicked. And they go, oh my word, this is what we've been waiting for. And, and you had whole villages that would come to know Christ. Because this was seen as the fulfillment of what this story was telling about. And this story is all over our part of Africa. And so you think about the great power in all these people that got saved in Samaria. You think of the Ethiopian eunuch. He's on his way back, and what does God do? God transplants Philip on the road. And do you realize that one of the earliest churches in church history was in Ethiopia? How did Ethiopia get the gospel? Because the power of God and the witness of one man with one man on his way back to Ethiopia. You think of you think of Paul. You think of this persecutor. You know, I would have had Paul on my list of he'll never get saved. And what does God do? God meets him on the road to Damascus and transforms his life. You think of Cornelius. I mean, God had to send a vision for Peter before he would ever go. <laughs> and you think of the power of God and the witness of, of Dorcas. And it says all the area. And, and you go through this and you see this empowered witness. And then you think of our own lives. When, how recently have you thought about where you would be if you weren't saved? What your life would be like if it hadn't been intersected by someone who shared the gospel with you and you trusted? Where would you be today? And this power of God and this witness, these empowered witness, this great power of God through the witness of people to transform lives. Look at the third characteristic. It's the end of verse 33. And with great power, the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And with great what? The last part of verse 33. And great grace was upon them all. Their witness was with great grace. Now, when we hear the word grace, what's the first verse that you think about? Yeah, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through Christ, and it's not of your own works. That's grace in the aspects of salvation. God's unmerited favor. That God in his graciousness provided a way for us to be saved. But this great grace here is not in the context of salvation. It's a Greek word that talks about being gracious, gracious manner, being in gracious acts or in manner, being gracious to people. Um, when I go to Chad, I get on a plane in Greensboro, North Carolina usually, and I fly to Atlanta. I get on another plane in, plane in Atlanta. And it's a nine-hour flight to Paris. I get to Paris and I get on another plane. 
and it's a six hour flight into the capital of Chad. There is nothing gracious about flying now. Any of you who have flown lately, there is no gracious manner. People are angry. <laughs> and, um, and then I get to Chad and I get on a 60 passenger Chinese bus. And it's an 18 to 24 hour trip down to where I'm going to teach. And it's all run by Arabs, because half of Chad is Arabic. And the minute we pull out of the station in the capital, they put on Arabic videos. Any of you seen any Arabic videos? Well, then they're not obs they're not sensuous. I mean, they're clothed, totally clothed. But they're jigging around and it's for 18 hours. After about three, I'm ready to kill somebody. We had a missionary who came in. He had the best trip because he was deaf and he just took off his hearing aids and planted them. And he just enjoyed the trip and the scenery. But there isn't anything gracious about that. And nobody is gracious in lines. But one of the aspects, characteristics of our empowered witness that is empowered by the Holy Spirit is that we are gracious. And keep your hand here, but go back to chapter 2 and look at verse 47. So this is after 3,000 people have been saved in verse 46. And they continued daily in one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat with their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having what? Favor. Favor with all men. That's our word, grace. One of the characteristics of these great, of spirit-empowered witness was that they had favor with everybody. These people were gracious. And they shared everything in common. You go to Acts chapter 2. You go to Acts chapter 4. And they shared all their belongings. Everybody had everything in common. That is only the Spirit's witness of graciousness. And the unsaved world could not get over this. That their spirit and power and witness was gracious. Go to Act, go to Romans. Just turn over Acts Romans. Look at Romans chapter 2. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But you know, you got this great theological book of Romans. And look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Or despisest thou the richness of his goodness, speaking of God, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that what? The goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repent. What won these Roman believers? Was the goodness, the graciousness of God, his loving manner, his mercy. And so you have these three characteristics of spirit-empowered witness. Boldness, great power, and graciousness. And I just have to tell a quick story. I was back in Chad this last time. And so on Sunday, so I teach... Monday through Friday, and sometimes on Saturday, and then Sunday I'm in a different church. So I was in three different churches. And God was good in the first church, and there was one saved, and the second church there were two saved. So I get to the three, the third Sunday, and I was I was joking in Sunday school, in Chad we filled the church from the front to the back. And the, this was a tiny little mud brick church with a 
brass roof, but it was packed. And um, preaching through an interpreter and gave the invitation. And I don't know if you've ever been where you give that witness and then the Holy Spirit works and you could feel it. And there were like 40 people out of this congregation that came forward dealing with sin, some of them for salvation, some of them to get right with the Lord. But you could, you could feel the Holy Spirit and this incredible sense that you who had given witness and the Holy Spirit took it and changed lives. And it was, it was one of those, I'm telling you, it was like goosebumps even yet to be... And you think of God's gracious manner that he allows us to be part of that and allows you to be a part of that because without your support, I wouldn't be able to go. And so one of these days when we're all up in heaven, the chanting choir rocks. I mean, they sway and it's very rhythmic because they only have five notes in their scale. And it's great. And you have these indigenous hymns that they write. And... But you're going to be meeting people that have come to know Christ because of your faithfulness in giving and praying. And so I just want to thank you, but I have to ask questions. Um, there may be someone here today and you're saying, well, this witness thing, I don't understand this at all. It may be that you don't know Christ, your personal Savior. You can't witness of something that you don't know on a, on a, on a personal matter. So if you don't know Christ, your personal Savior, talk to somebody today. Do not leave. Because you have no guarantee of this afternoon or tomorrow. But most of us are believers. What is our, what is our witness like? Would, if you were going to characterize, would you, is your witness characterized by boldness? Is it, are you seeing God's power as you witness? Are you seeing, is your witness graciousness, kindness that comes through, that make people want to listen to your witness? But if we're going to witness, we got to make sure that we're in right relationship with the Holy Spirit, that we are filled so that then we can speak and then give them power and witness. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's just amazing that you would want for us to be witnesses of, to you and to what you've done in our lives. So our Father, help us to be the witness that you would want us to be. Help us to intersect with those that our longing to know the peace, contentment, and grace that only you can give. Help us, our Father, in Christ's name.